a small gift. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the kind invite and for taking time out. And I do apologize for Nathan. I did my best. But <laughs> there's only so much you can do when you start off with that product. Um, so what I'd like to do very briefly is just talk about where we're at in terms of state of affairs with regards to atmospheric oxygen. And to cut a long story short, what the, the take-home message is, is I think we are further behind the ball now than we were even 10 years ago. I'm going to explain why. But nonetheless, I'm going to try and go very quickly through a lot of the information that we have and hopefully give you at least a picture for what, there is a coherent story in there. There is a diamond amongst the, the weeds there, but it's not necessarily easy to see. So I want to go back to a diagram or a, a, a picture that many of you have probably seen before from Lee Kump. And this is based on work from Jim Casting and, and Walker much earlier on. But it shows the evolution of oxygen as being essentially a two-step process. The first step, what we call the Great Oxidation Event, around 2.5. Back when Dick Holland was talking about it, he thought it was 2.2 .2 to 2.3. So this is the first significant rise in oxygen. And then we get a second rise associated with the Neoproterozoic and also with animal evolution. I'm not going to focus so much on this part as I am on this part right here. Now, the line's kind of skewed over. It should be 2.5 and to the right of that. But anyways, what Lee did in this paper is he essentially bounded in white are actually constraints on the numbers. So you might be wondering what constrains the lower limit at 2.5 to 0.001 percent present atmospheric levels. Some of you might know instead of percent as 10 to negative 5 pal. So sometimes some of them do it in percent, some of them don't. So that defines the lower number. So before 2.5, the, the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere was smaller than that. How small? We don't know. We just know by about 2.5-ish, it rises above that. And although this is drawn as a straight line, really we're looking at by the time we get to about 2.2 or so, that oxygen could have been up to about 1%. It's constrained. The 1% is constrained by things such as red beds, um, paleosols. The 40% comes from Don Canfield's work where he hypothesized quite some time ago that during what they call the Middle Earth period that the oceans went euxinic, i.e. there was lots of free sulfide in the water column, which meant you need a lot of sulfate supply. How much oxygen do you need to oxidize enough pyrite to give you that sulfate? That's the 40%. So that's what balanced this diagram. But what really clearly defines that one, and what it was used as a smoking gun explanation for when did oxygen first accumulate in the atmosphere it comes from James Farquhar's seminal paper in 2000 looking at sulfur myth. I'm just taking this from David Johnson's review paper. But essentially the red dots as we go back in time represent what we call sulfur myth. Mass independent fractionation of sulfur recorded as 33, delta 33S. You see that it's very high between 2.7, 2.5. There are peaks before that. And then it drops quite significantly at 2.32 then it's gone for good. <laughs> Okay, we still get some, let's say, in the Antarctic kingdom, um, where there's like the ozone hole and that, but in general, it's gone. Now, okay, I think pointer is goosed. Pointer is goosed. I will stick to this. Um, oh, maybe I won't. I have a spare. Oh, here's a star. Thank I'm you. prepared. <laughs> That's not a good one. I run out after one slide. Um, <laughs> where is the thing? So that's what we call the smoking gun for atmosphere O2 because to get this signal to 33S, you essentially need an anoxic atmosphere. Reducing gases like hydrogen or methane, sulfur availability, but no oxygen. That's the key because oxygen does two things. So when you get the sulfur signal here, this is basically a photochemical reaction. You take something like SO2, um, it goes through photolysis and it forms two different products, an elemental sulfur product, which has a positive fractionation, and sulfate, which forms sulfuric acid, which has a negative product. They fall into the surface of the earth. They, where it doesn't get homogenized, you then pick up the different signatures, so you can either get a positive 33 or a negative 33. Oxygen does two things. Oxygen oxidizes the elemental sulfur, everything back to sulfate, so it scrubs out <laughs> the signal. Plus O2 produces ozone, which prevents the signal from being reached in the first place. So this has been long thought of as the definitive proof that we had no oxygen in the atmosphere before 2.5, and then we do at 2.5. And the number 10 to minus 5 comes from Pavlov and Casting's work for what is the level of oxygen that cuts off the channel from which we go form the elemental sulfur. Okay? Now the GOE itself, the Great Oxidation Event itself, 
is grounded, in my opinion, in lots of geological observation done over decades of work. And this is just taken from Andre Becker's summary paper. Um, essentially, the green represent pieces of evidence that suggest we had a reducing atmosphere or ocean seawater, and the red is oxidizing. And so this is brackets where we start with the GOE, sometimes from 2.5 to 2.3. Then there's this thing called the Loma Gundi event. This is a period of time where we think there was so much oxygen production because there was a lot of biomass being buried at that time. You bury a lot of biomass, so you sink a lot of carbon-12 into the sediments. Your carbonates, your limestones, become enriched in carbon-13. So you get this big excursion right here. So this is supposed to represent a time when oxygen levels could have gone all the way up to 50% of today. But we're thinking about this part of what gets us into the GOE. So looking at things like it. So here's the sulfur 33 record. Myth, no myth. So like I said, the myth starts to be lost at 2.45 and it's completely gone by 2.32. Now some have looked at the rock record in detail and suggested that the loss from myth to non-myth can be as short as 10 million years. But in this mess, there's actually several episodes where we have myth and no myth. But after 2.32, it's gone. Then we look at the 34 sulfur record. In other words, we have very little sulfur fractionation. This is mass dependent fractionation. So there's very little difference between the sulfates and sulfides. After 2.4, the spread gets bigger. The spread gets bigger because there's more sulfate in the oceans, more sulfate in the oceans because you had more powered oxidation on land via O2. And not surprisingly, we start getting marine sulfate deposits. This over here, the green, the presence of the trital uraninite and pyrite. So these are the trital clastic grains of minerals that are easily oxidized in the presence of oxygen. Before 2.45, they exist in the rock record. After, they don't. That tells us there was enough oxygen around, something all the way from 0.1 to 1% O2, basically scrubs out that record. Red beds are just basically rusty sediments. Paleocells are ancient soils. Before 2.3, Essentially, the paleosols are iron depleted. In other words, they're being weathered under reducing conditions. The iron, too, gets solubilized, gets washed away. They're depleted in iron. As soon as you get oxygen, the ferrous iron dissolves but gets re-oxidized as ferric iron. It gets retained. Iron formations, this is the stuff that I work on. They basically have it as reducing because you have to bring iron onto the continental shelves to form these large iron deposits. That means the oceans have to be frigid or reducing to transport the ferrous iron from a hydrothermal vent to the site of that position. And then the big one was manganese oxides. And this is one that a lot of people keep pointing their finger to. At 2.2, which was the old age for the Hoda cell formation, these are the largest manganese deposits around. The only way to oxidize manganese 2 to manganese 4 is presumed to be via O2. So the presence of these manganese ores would suggest that it's O2. The point being, though, is that the Hoda cell formation is now at 2.4, so that throws it right over to here. And then we've got some other things which I'm going to talk about. So the argument right now in terms of triggering the GOE is, was it instantaneous? Was it, was it um, prolonged? My interpretation is that it's probably prolonged. It starts at 2.5, and at 2.32, it's completely gone. And there's a lot of competing things happening in between. So I just want to quickly talk about the chromium record. So this is a paper that came out in 2009 by Robert Fry, where they looked at the chromium isotopes in banded, for it, and banded iron formations through time. And essentially, you see, this is the crustal um, isotopic value. Anything above this line is a positive fractionation. And the positive fractionation was used to infer O2. And here's how the story goes. You start off with chromium-3 in something like chromite. It's insoluble, right? So chromite's pretty insoluble. You don't get chromium to the depositional basin of the BIF unless you can mobilize it. The argument is that it gets mobilized as chromium-6 chromate, which is soluble. But O2 doesn't do that reaction directly. In fact, O2 goes through this intermediate phase of oxidizing manganese-2 to manganese-4. Manganese-4 then reacts with chromium-3 to produce chromium-6. That step has an oxidative is an oxidative mechanism, has a positive fractionation all the way up to plus seven. So that positively fractionated chromate then hits the seawater. In the seawater where there's lots of ferrous iron, now we know there's tons of ferrous iron because there's banded iron formations being precipitated at this time, so the oceans are chock-a-block with ferrous iron. Ferrous iron instantaneously reduces chromium-6 to chromium-3. The iron gets oxidized to iron-3, so you precipitate out this ferric chromium hydroxide phase. Because this reaction is quantitative, even though it has an isotopic fractionation, it doesn't get recorded. So the recorded fractionation in the BIF then comes from that stage, which is the positive. Yeah? So if you see a positive 
by inference, you must have had O2. That's how the model goes. That's why this paper gets into nature, because at 2.8, we have positive fractionations. So suddenly, we're 300 million years earlier than the GOE. Now, a couple problems with this. One, manganese-4 is insoluble, chromium-3 is insoluble. You have to somehow get the chromium-3 into solution so it can interact with the manganese to give you the chromate. The chromate can't see any ferrous iron on its transport from land to the oceans, so it can't be reduced, but it has to get to the BIF. We know that because that's where it's been recorded. So it's somehow chromium has gotten to the oceans. But for it to do that, it can't see any ferrous iron on its route. And the third and major point is there's different kinds of iron formations. I don't really want to get into too much detail, but there's what we call the superior type banded iron formations. These are the really large ones we think of, like the Gunflint, the Hammersley, the Transvaal in South Africa. These are forming on continental shelves, close to the continents. Then there's the Algoma type. These are ones that form in submarine hydrothermal vents. Think of something like the Red Sea today. These iron formations that Fry used come from the Algoma type. So imagine using sediment from the Red Sea to tell you something about weathering of the land in Israel. That's kind of the analogy. That's the problem I have with it. They used the wrong BIF. Then you replot this, and sorry, unlike where everything looks like you've got a significant fractionation and then it goes with a big arrow, let's put it into perspective. Let's do it to one standard deviation, and we don't really have very much happening until near Prozoic. So, my take on this is that is not significant as an oxidative story, simply because they used the wrong BIF to start with. But, intrigued by that proposition, we started looking at chromium concentrations in iron formations through time. So we didn't look at the isotopes, we simply looked at their concentrations. We normalized the titanium because we wanted to look for orthogenic enrichment. We didn't want to just have a lot of chromium coming in as the trital particles. So this is our baseline. When you look at there's quite a, there's scatter. There's no doubt there is some enrichment of chromium before the GOE. Could have come in with a clay particle, could have come in organically, don't really know. But what is significant is when you take a look at these, and these are, sorry, the reds and the blues are superior type BIF. One is classic chemical precipitate, the other one's contaminated with the trital components. That's the difference in color. But nonetheless, by 2.48, in the Penge, in the Kuramin, in South Africa, we start seeing a significant rise. And by the time we get to 2.3, the Kawi in Brazil, the, the Willy Wally in Australia, it gets even bigger. And then by 2.3 to the Timeball Hill in South Africa, we see a massive peak of chromium, and then it drops. Now what's interesting about these is all of these formations have clastic components in it. So they're all near shore iron formations. Sometimes we use the term granular iron formation versus banded, which is a chemical precipitate. At the same time, some of the really big BIF, like the Dales Gorge at 2.45, the Joffrey at 2.44, sorry, at 2.4, no, 2.47, 2.45, um, show no fractionation at all. These are the ones that form in deeper water. In other words, in this thing, we have a lot of different data points here. The classic BIF that form offshore have no chromium. Only the ones in nearshore have chromium, and that makes sense because if you buy into the chromium-6 model, chromium-6, as soon as it hits seawater, gets reduced, right? It doesn't make it into the open ocean. I'm gonna argue for something completely different. I'm gonna argue for chromium-3. Now, the reason chromium-3 can't go very far is because chromium-3, as I'm gonna show you, can only be mobilized under acidic conditions. You hit pH 8 oceans, it precipitates out. So deep water BIF will never show a chromium signature. By nature, we had to look at the shallow ones. And clearly something is happening between 2.45 and 2.32. Why do I go for the chromium-3? Well, you go to modern rivers, and you can just take a look at the chromium concentration, and a lot of those rivers are dominated by chromium-3. In fact, the more acidic you get, the higher the chromium concentrations. And we're not talking just trivial increases, we're talking orders of magnitude increases as the pH goes down. Looking at stability plot here, these are our chromium-6, these are all our chromium-3. This is all insoluble. This, to get solubilized, basically needs a high redox potential. This doesn't, it's all pH dependent. That red line is, I just basically added the iron chromium hydroxide line. So basically anything to the left of that can be solubilized, but only at a pH of less than five. So if it's gonna be chromium-3 making it a BIF, I need acidic conditions. And how do I get acidic conditions? Well. Let's think about acid mine drainage today. Basically, any abandoned mine, very acidic waters, high concentration of ferric iron, which stays in solution under low pH, high sulfate, high trace metals. What drives acid mine drainage? Well, quite briefly, it's the action of aerobic bacteria. So what this plot shows is essentially just the rates of reaction, and very, very quickly. You look at reaction number two. That's just putting pyrite in the presence of oxygen 
the iron dissolves to ferrous iron, the sulfide gets oxidized. Reasonably flat line, it does increase in terms of rates because some of the protons will be consumed. Rate number three is then the oxidation of the ferrous iron to ferric iron. Ferric iron is stable at low pH, not much happens, and then it kicks off at higher pH. Why? Because ferric hydroxide hydrolyzes to form ferrihydrite, so you drive the reactions that way. So that's the rate of production of ferric iron. But the key rate of pyrite oxidation happens at pHs less than 4.5 when ferric iron solution reacts with pyrite. This is a really fast reaction, generates lots of acidity. So if you ever have a, an abandoned mine site, the pH gets below 4.5, you're stuffed. That's when things get bad. Before it, before it gets to 4.5, you can still control it. But the key point here is that this reaction is fast. We're consuming 14 ferric irons producing ferrous iron at a rate way faster than the ferric iron can be generated. So just looking at the difference between the rates of reaction, you should never get acid mine drainage. But the reason you do get acid mine drainage is because bacteria drive this reaction, number three prime. In other words, our argument was you can get acidic conditions by oxidizing pyrite, and that pyrite would have been oxidized by chemolithoautotrophic bacteria on land. And just getting back to this figure, so that explains what's happening here. But then again, we never see the same high chromium afterwards, even under an oxic conditions. Why is that the case? Well, what our argument was is that you imagine before 2.5, before there's any oxygen in the atmosphere, pyrite's accumulating in the continental crust, not being oxidized. It's just sitting there, right? As soon as you put oxygen in there, you get pyrite oxidation, you create acidity. That acidity causes the dissolution of chromium-3 minerals like chromite, mobilizing chromium-3 to the oceans where it hits pH 8 water, precipitates out instantly. That's why it's in the near shore BIF. Not only do you mobilize chromium, but you mobilize things like phosphate, other trace elements, and essentially, you get the Loma Gundi event at 2.2, which is a time of great organic productivity. We would argue that because of this acid weathering, lots of trace metals, including phosphate, get washed in the ocean. You get a big spurt in primary productivity. Lots of biomass gets buried. Carbon isotope record changes, and lots of O2 goes into the atmosphere. So it's all kind of linked. But why it doesn't happen after here is because by that time, all the pyrite's been exhausted. All the pyrite's been oxidized, the atmosphere re-equilibrates with the land surface. So it's a one-off. So in other words, just, instead of just looking at, this is a repeated theme I'm going to get to, instead of just looking at one piece of evidence and saying, this is paradigm shifting, which is what a lot of papers want to say, it actually tries to incorporate what we see and why, even though things get oxic, that model doesn't work anymore because it's a one-off. But anyways, that's how we explain the chromium. But this is what we use as a record for the start of the GOE, 2.48. Just another real quick example of using trace metals um, hooked up with a, a bunch of other colleagues looking at copper in shales, copper in BIF. You can see in the patterns, there is no pattern here. It's almost, it could be, could be anything, but basically there's nothing here to tell me anything's changed until you get to looking at the copper isotopes. Where you see that pre-GOE, that the shales, this is actually the, sh the copper isotopes in shales, sorry, that they're enriched in copper 63 or depleted in copper 65. And then once you get to GOE and after, they become enriched in copper 65. What our story is this, is that pre-GOE, you have copper 63, copper 65 in the oceans. But as iron formations are forming and settling out, the iron preferentially scrubs out the 65 copper. So it gets incorporated into the BIF, leaving 63 copper in solution in seawater, which gets incorporated into the plankton, which then gets incorporated into shales. Hence the reason that the shales are 63 rich. After the GOE, two things happen. We get less banded iron formation after the great oxidation event. Quite quickly, one of the reasons being is that there's lots of sulfate being washed in the oceans, which leads to bacterial sulfate reduction. Lots of sulfide, the iron gets scrubbed out before it ever makes it onto the shelf. Less biff. Less of a sink for 65. But at the same time, oxidative weathering of copper sulfide minerals preferentially releases 65 copper into solution, which then makes it into the ocean and gets incorporated into the biomass and eventually the shells. So once again, an indicator that something is happening at that point in time. The question then is how does it fit in with a broader model? And that's where we're going to kind of go. Now, I'm not the only one working on it. Lots of people are working on it. But I want to make one point in here in terms of kind of the chronology of this. So in 2007, this was a significant paper by Errol Anbar where they looked at the Mount McRae shale at 2.5. So in 2007, we still thought the GOE was around 2.3-ish or going all the way back to 2.45, but certainly not earlier. In their Mount McRae shales, they found this enrichment in molybdenum over about a 10 meter span. 
And they said that molybdenum enrichment came from oxidative weathering of molybdenum sulfide minerals on land. And then the key point is molybdenum drops, hence oxidation stopped. So they coined this term called the whiff of oxygen. So for a period of time, there's enough oxygen to oxidize sulfides, and then it drops. And that was 50 million years before the GOE at 2.5. And just using sedimentation rates, you think about it, so it's 10 meters. If you had a shale being deposited at a millimeter a year, which is ridiculously fast, you're looking at at least 10,000 year process. Their argument being is that in 10,000 years, even under low oxygenizing conditions, i.e. less than 10 to the 5, so you can still preserve your sulfur myth, which you have, there is enough oxygen to oxidize a 100 micrometer cubed pyrite grain in 10,000 years. That's the model. Of course, it assumes that that same particle has sat there for 10,000 years being oxidized, and it's all flowing into the exact same depositional basin, and deposition hasn't moved. But notwithstanding, that's the point. And then, I'm not going to talk about uh, Linda and Paul's paper, but they're looking at 2.67 black shells where they see there's an oxidative component to the nitrogen cycle. Then um, looking at rocks that are slightly younger than these rocks, uh, the argument that based on rhenium and, and osmium and molybdenum argued that there could have been up to like 100 meters of oxygen on the shelf at 2.6. I'm going to return to this paper from Ava Stoikin in a second, but basically they looked at sulfur availability in sediments pre-GOE, and they said at 2.8 they could already see that there was more sulfur in those sediments that could possibly be accounted by models looking at how much can be contributed by volcanism. So, you know, volcano spewed H2S, SO2. They quantified how much that was. They found in their sediments there was more pirate than that. Hence, there must have been pirate oxidation on land bringing extra sulfur in. At 3.0, we go to chromium isotopes. We here, and I'm a part of this paper, used molybdenum isotopes at 3 billion. The difference between our two papers is this one argues for atmospheric oxygen, this one argues just for oxygen in the water column. I'm gonna get back to that point because I think that point's important. Um, Clark Johnson's group gets it by, based on uranium availability and, and increased uranium and on the same paper with Robbie Fry. And in fact, this was a paper, this is based on a paper that uh, Monique Rosen did a long time ago, all the way to 3.75. So within nine years, we went from 2.5 to 3.75 based on different things. So it's like, instead of constraining the GOE, we are expanding the GOE. And to make life even more of a laugh, we then have papers that purport, this is from Nuvakwetuk, which is 3.8. I've worked on these rocks before, so uh, we know there's at least 3.8, where in this paper they've argued that we've got microfossils that look like iron oxidizing bacteria. Here's the point though, they don't, they, by inference, say they're iron oxidizing bacteria. They compare them to modern bacteria, but iron oxidizing bacteria today require oxygen. Oxygen plus Fe2 forms the ferric hydroxide. Indeed, these are deep water deposits, so they're arguing, without being explicit, implicitly, that there's O2 in deep water already at 3.85, based on some, a fossil that looks like it could be a modern iron oxidizing bacteria. Then there's this paper that I think Claude has mentioned to you, a lot of you before, we're looking at the Jack Hill zircons. These are the oldest fragments of Earth. We don't have any older rocks than 3.85, but we have older minerals. In that, in a highlight right here of 10,000 zircons, one zircon had graphite in it, and that was interpreted to be possibly organic carbon. I'm not personally wanting to pick on these particular papers, but the reason I flag them is, where do we go from here? We're at the oldest rocks, the oldest minerals. Now, previously, the, when I gave a talk at Yale about three years ago, after the paper I did with Noah, I was joking around at the time when we had at 3.0, I go, as we speak, someone is going to be working on 3.2 because that's the next oldest rocks. 3.3 is the fig, no, 3.2 is the Moody's, 3.3 fig tree, 3.4 dresser, and then you get to Izua and Nuvakotok. Well, it wasn't just short oil, it was like within months we gone to that, and now suddenly we're all at the very oldest rock and at the oldest mineral. So where do we go from here? Well. I would be willing to wager a six pack that there's going to be a paper saying that we have evidence of cyanobacteria based on those zircons. Because what else can you do? How else are you gonna get your nature science paper unless you can outdo that? And that is one of my problems, is it, this really has become a competition of outdoing one another, of pushing it back, without thinking about what does it actually mean. So, if we take, this is all true, that this actually is evidence of O2, there's two things we can take from that. One, we get oxidative weathering at concentrations of O2 less than 10 to negative five, or that we have these special events called whiffs in which oxygen rises periodically, then oxygen drops. And this is Tim Lyne's review paper that 
probably many of you have seen this figure, I've added a couple of the extra whiffs here. Now, what people like to point to when you talk about whiffs is there was this study done by Stephanie Olson, who's now doing a, a PhD with Tim at, at Riverside, where they modeled, using the Gini model, how much O2 you could have had in an Archean ocean, based on, yes, modern continental configuration, but on an atmosphere with no O2, with high methane, um, basically high ferrous iron, and cyanobacterial activity at a tenth of, uh, oh, sorry, a tenth of what it is today. They ran a model for 40,000 years, and what it basically showed is that you could get areas of the Earth, of the Earth's ocean, sorry, where you could accumulate O2. So this isn't disequilibrium, I just wanna make one point. The atmosphere is reducing. The atmosphere has high methane to keep the planet warm. The ocean, though, can be in disequilibrium in the surface ocean with some O2, because the exchange isn't that quick. But their argument is, is that you could have pockets of water where concentrations could be around one micrometer, micromole all the way up to six. To put that in perspective, today is about 250. Okay, so we're looking at 1% we could have had. From that model now, we have to somehow transport the oxygen through the methane atmosphere to land for the oxidative reactions to take place. Now, no one's ever explained how you trigger the whiff, how one then triggers the loss of a whiff, and what I'm really problematic is that some of these deposits, for example, I never talked about the crow paper at three billion years old, but what they basically had is they had a paleosol, the soils, where they found a negative chromium fractionation and the banded iron formation where they had the positive. So to get the positive transport to seawater, you leave a negative behind. That's offset by about 50 million years. So their width has to last at least 50 million years. So 50 million years in terms of catchment to me seems a bit hard to understand. I always think about a classic picture I use when I teach first year from Grotzinger, where you see the, <clears throat> where you see the Mississippi, the mouth present 3,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago. But what you need for this model is that your same depositional basin, the same site of deposition hasn't changed in 50 million years ago, so it's allowed this all to accumulate. I really struggle with the whole idea of a whiff. So we came up with, instead of just saying, I don't like whiff and leaving at that, we tried to come up with, well, how do we explain the whiff? Because the whiff ultimately is an atmospheric signal. So we said, well, why not look at cyanobacterial mats? Today we can go to lots of different modern environments. This is just some mats we found in Venezuela. It was a bit of a jammy, so Los Rocas is a really famous beach resort, and if you're Canadian in February, trust me, you wanna leave Edmonton. So we happen to pick a good place, like Venezuela, and when you take a look at these lagoons right here, and you measure O2 production, that's the, the interface between the, the stromatolite and the water. We see that's the point too, that's atmospheric O2, right? Or you could equilibrate it into micromolars, that's gonna be like 300 micromolars, or whatever that value is. It's super saturated. So at, in the mat, you actually super saturate with regards to O2, and we have sulfide at depth, and at night the sulfide moves up. We're not the first people to ever show that you reach within a cyanobacterial mat super saturation. I mean, Herman and Kump modeled this a decade ago saying that in the Archean, you could have had cyanobacterial mats growing in an anox anoxic atmosphere, producing O2 within a mat, independent of what's around them. Don Sumner just did a really good study from some perennial ice-covered lakes in, in the Antarctic and showed that you have microbial mats, cyanobacterial mats, growing in the water column at depths where there's no oxygen. So oxygen stops like at nine meters, at 9.8, you've got these mats producing O2 which diffuses out the top and the bottom. So we argued, can the O2 produced by these mats give you the oxidative features associated with what people report in terms of molybdenum, rhenium, sulfate, or whatever like that. But here's a key point. Our oxidative weathering is taking place in situ on a mat. It has nothing to do with the atmosphere, okay? It's no different than today arguing, looking at CO2 in a soil and arguing that the CO2 level in the soil is atmospheric. We know that's ridiculous. We don't do it today, but we're doing it then. So this is a complicated diagram and I'm definitely not gonna have enough, I've got another hour, right? So I'm good. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm not kidding. Um, sorry, so this is just, no I am kidding. Um, this is just a diagram showing the size of the reservoir for O2 and this is on an annual basis, so it's really two parts and that is just blown up over here. So it shows you the different sources of O2 and the different sinks of O2. And the most important thing is when we consider today, O2 is basically, it's not changing. Okay, we're at equilibrium right now. So the amount of O2 that's created through the barrel of organic carbon, the way to think about that is cyanobacteria produce O2 in carbon. If it all goes to aerobic respiration, there's a net gain of nothing. 
But if you bury some of the organic carbon, that O2, which came from it, doesn't get used up. Okay? So the O2 created from the burial of organic carbon is balanced by the amount of O2 you need for weathering of continental crust and gases. So that's basically consistent today. And one of the points I want to make is that if you're going to fundamentally change the atmosphere to create a whiff to get you to 10%, 1%, whatever number you want, it's not something that's going to be very quick. We're talking on time frames of tens, of th tens to hundreds of thousands of years. Now, the atmospheric modelers would agree with this, and they have argued that GOE could be fast within a million years, within 100,000 years. Different models give you different numbers. But to have a whiff like it's Monday, Tuesday we got a whiff, and whatever like that, it doesn't happen like that. But one of the things we wanted to do, the exercise, one of the exercises was is we wanted to say, look, if you take a look at molybdenum in the rock record or sulfate, and you argue for oxidative weathering, can we produce enough O2 from these microbial mats to give you that signal? So we look at modern O2 net production, not gross, net is after the O2 is used up in internal respiration, of this value, and we integrate it over the continental land surface. So in other words, this 100%. Imagine 100% of the Earth today covered in a microbial mat generating O2 at that rate. That gets us pretty close to the modern global primary pro productivity number. And that includes terrestrial and marine. We know that's basically 50% terrestrial, 50% marine. So that's almost the same as modern global primary productivity on land. Okay? But that's assuming everything's covered in, con every bit of continent's covered in microbial mats. So now we go back to, let's go to a realistic number. The amount of O2 we need to balance a day. And this blue line is that rate, and we go down, what we find out is that only 0.3 of the Earth's surface needs to be covered in microbial mass to give us the O2 to balance the amount of O2 we need for oxidation. Now where it gets really cool is we go to Ava Stoiken's paper where she argues for oxygen at 2.8. This is the amount of O2 you would need to give you the sulfate that she argues for. Where that line intersects, we're talking way down here. In other words, you don't need a lot of microbial mass on continents to give you the O2 to give you the sulfur signal, the molybdenum signal, and it certainly doesn't mean we have to invoke the atmosphere. So I like to think about it this way. Imagine I've got land here, and that's the ocean. In fact, it's just a microbial pond, a, a pond, sorry, with microbial mats. But I'm over here, I've got a microbial mat growing on top of pyrite. It oxidizes the sulfide, the sulfate, if it's, a molyb if it's molybdite, molybdenum, or whatever. Trace element gets washed into the oceans where it gets buried and accumulated in the sediment. We core this sediment three billion years later in Bob's Drunko. We find molybdenum, we find sulfate. Got oxidative weathering. No problem at all. Chromium, on the other hand, is the problem. Because if we oxidize chromium-3 to chromium-6, that chromium-6 has to get from here to here without ever seeing ferrous iron. It's ridiculous because at that time, there's nothing but mafic continental crust. It is not not going to see ferrous iron. And all these other arguments for chromium infer that it's all surface overflow. They don't take into account you've got groundwater going through basaltic aquifers. In other words, there is no way in my mind you can explain weathering of chromium-3 here and tie it to the signal of positive chromium fractionation there. It just doesn't make any sense in my mind. So let's assume now that these signatures are of O2. I don't care. I'm not talking about atmospheric O2. I think I've been scrapped out a long time ago. But there is cyanobacteria three billion years ago. I don't want to go beyond three billion. I don't believe the 3.7, 3.8. I think that's fantasy. But I might be wrong. We can't, never know. But if that's the case, the question one has to do then is ask, if oxygen already evolves at three billion or earlier, but we don't see the GOE until about 2.4, why? What accounts for that gap in time? And a lot of papers, a lot of research is being directed at that. One of the most common things is the argument, well, you know, there's just a lot of reductance around. Reduced crust, reduced iron in the oceans. The oxygen just simply took time to build up because there were so many things to scrub out. This is one of the popular stories from Lee Kump and Mark Barley who have been pushing this for a while where they said at 2.7 to 2.5, the continents are getting bigger. As you go from submarine volcanism to subaerial volcanism, the gases released by the volcanoes become more oxidizing. So instead of having reduced gases like H2, methane, hydrogen sulfide, you think like CO2 and SO2. Because there's nothing to oxidize here, the oxygen has no sink. Oxygen is allowed to build up. This is just an advancement of that model by Gaillard and all. And they kind of tie this. What I like about this paper is it tries to do more than just one thing. It tries to tie this to MIF signal. So 
Claude's probably talked about this at some point in front of you, but it's just really short. In the early Archean, the early Earth, there might have been continental crust. But the question is, how much continental crust was emergent? This thing called freeboard. How much of it's exposed above the waterline? Okay, and there's lots of arguments not only about how much continental crust there was, period, but how much of it was above the waterline. Because on the earlier, hotter Earth, you had thicker amounts of mafic ocean crust, but it wasn't as rigid as modern continental crust. So in other words, you couldn't build really big mountains. And if you can't build big mountains, you can't have deep oceans. So the oceans were shallower. And the argument was is that most of the land mass was probably covered in water, with a few volcanic islands. Think of little New Zealand's or Hawaii's sticking out. That was the land mass. Over 100, at, sorry, at 10 bar or 100 meters depth, the sulfur that comes out through depressurization, or sorry, the sulfur that comes out is mostly in the form of HS. As you get emergent, the sulfur speciation changes to SO2. That SO2 gets released. SO2 then, plus hydrogen, that's the key point here. Hydrogen goes, there's something called hydrogen escape. So if you lose hydrogen, you basically oxidize progressively the planet. But the SO2, which is released once you get terrestrial oxidation, forms sulfate, you get MIF. So this explains the big MIF signal between 2.7 and 2.5. Sulfate comes into the ocean, gets reduced to sulfide, it reacts with ferrous iron to form pyrite. Oxygen not consumed in the oxidation of ferrous iron then is free to release. So it tries to tie a lot of things in, like what's the MIF signal telling us about things. But once again, it comes down to looking at volcanic gases. And then there's quite a few papers in the last few years that have really focused on this. And in short, what the first four papers are really telling us is that between 3.0 and 2.5, we get a lot more continental land mass, and that continental land mass is changing in composition from ultramafic, mafic in composition to felsic. So as you go from mafic to felsic, you lose a lot of the reductance in the crust. Once again, you lose your oxygen sink. And in this paper, an interesting twist where they're saying, look, before you get broad continental shelves and you preserve your organic carbon near continents, when you have these little Small continents, any organic carbon produced would be pushed into a deep ocean and get subducted. A billion years of subduction, assuming it's sort of 3.5, which they do, means you're burying a lot of organic carbon over a long period of time. That could lead to the increase in O2. And a slight twist on this model came here. One argument's been always made in terms of the O2 story. One easy way of generating the GOE is if you could simply bury more organic carbon. You bury more organic carbon, O2 rises. Could that be the GOE? That would be magic if we could say that. But the problem is, if you look at the carbon isotope record through time, this is the inorganic, it's basically flatlined before the GOE in Lamagundi, and it flatlines so-called the boring billion. And that's always been interpreted to say that because the carbon isotope record remained static, you could not have buried any more organic carbon. Because if you bury more organic carbon, you sink a lot of carbon-12, the oceans become enriched in carbon-13, which becomes these excursions. What they basically said was, you know what? If you actually model this, you can actually get small increases in the amount of organic carbon earlier on. Because imagine this, you have an atmosphere with very little O2. You got organic carbon produced, buried in the sediment, sediment gets uplifted, puts onto, onto land. It gets weathered into the oceans. Today, O2 from the atmosphere oxidizes that organic carbon completely. But at that time, there's not enough O2. Organic carbon can build, because at that time, organic carbon, sorry, O2 is also oxidizing gases in the atmosphere like methane. So this record might not actually be true, so we could have had an increase in carbon burial, which would be a really easy way of sorting this. And I just flagged these two papers. I wasn't sure if Bob wasn't gonna be here, so it was gonna be nice. Um, and also, for this is from the Caltech days, and still Caltech days, where they argue one of the biggest problems they have is that they argue that if cyanobacteria evolved within a very short time frame, everything should have been oxidized. They gave it 100,000 years. That's the argument. So the way they run their models, maybe that's true. That you can, in other words, you can oxidize things very quickly and that it shouldn't have taken hundreds of million years to increase. But I just want to make one line here. Um, calculations illustrate oxygenation would have overwhelmed redox buffers within 100,000 years following the emergence of oxygen to photosynthesis, a geologically short amount of time, unless rates of primary producti productivity were far lower. I think that is a key point. Because how else could we explain it? Well, one is that cyanobacteria, in fact, were nutrient starved. I have till, what time do I have till? Um, you, well, uh, you have another 15 minutes, but then uh, there would be a little time for questions. So I will wrap up things quite quickly then. Okay. 
basically, people have argued that cyanobacteria were neutral and starved. A classic paper by Bergram and Canfield argued, look, at a time when BIF were settling out, the iron particles would have taken out all the phosphate, the cyanobacteria would have been starved. If the cyanobacteria is starved, they can't produce much O2. So maybe the cyanobacteria simply didn't have a key nutrient. And then we, there's lots of papers that came out, okay, it's phosphate, maybe it's molybdenum, maybe it's whatever. Okay? Maybe the cyanobacteria were there, they just weren't happy. We turned around a few years later and said, well, that model, yeah, it's good. In fact, it inspired me to get into this trace element work, but it didn't consider the broader composition of the oceans at that time because it's not an issue of just looking at ferric iron scrubs out phosphate. In fact, the oceans had tons of silica. We know it because band ion formations are iron silica beds. In the presence of a lot of silica, phosphate simply doesn't bind. It's a competition thing. Silica prefers the iron oxide surface more than phosphate. So we said it's rubbish. And in some work we did with Noah where we looked at iron phosphate ratios through time. Yes, if you look at it just in terms of absolute concentration, it does look like in the past we had a lot less than the modern. But if you apply the different KD values, I didn't really get into that, but you can do a KD value, how much phosphate binds to iron oxide on its own, how much phosphate binds onto an iron silicate. That line's a lot more shallow. If you apply to different KDs, what you find out is that phosphate was pretty consistent throughout time, except for this part in the cryogenian, which I'll get to in a second. Well, actually, the take home message from that paper was, phosphate's always been around, it was never limiting, but at the cryogenian deglaciation, all the glacial till and, 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 and rock flour gets washed into the oceans, tons of phosphates in there, spurs on the cyanobacteria, they produce lots of O2, enough O2 that animals are, evolve. That's the take home message. We've since, done a paper looking, on another paper looking at in shales. And interesting, the shales give us this story. The shales tend to tell us that phosphate concentrations were subdued, and we argue that there was a deep, deep sea trap for phosphate. The BIF records shallow waters, the shales are recording deeper waters, so phosphate in a ferruginous ocean is gonna precipitate out as vivinite. So maybe indeed, there was phosphate limitation. The point is, I don't know, I'm on both those papers and I don't know what to make of it. Different lithologies are showing me different things. What do I do with that? I don't know at this point in time. Then there's other studies that just recently came out and said, look, there was also phosphate limitation. And the reason there was phosphate limitation is because there were no terminal electron acceptors to oxidize the organic carbon back in the Archean. No O2, no nitrate, no sulfate, which means that the cells, they died, the phosphate couldn't be liberated from the organic complexes, so basically they starved. Now, another point is that maybe the cyanobacteria weren't starved, it's just were marginalized. In short, this is one, one of my favorite figures because it shows you the carbon isotope fractionation in kerogen over 150 million years ago. And the take home message here is, whether you're in deep sea or shallow water, the isotopic fractionation is very low, suggesting that you had methane productivity and methane oxidation. By the time you get to 2.6, we see only methane production in deep water, not the shallow water. This is now all photosynthetic or cyanobacterial. In other words, over that 100 million years, a 2.7, the deep water and the shallow water were dominated by methanogens. There's lots of methane in the atmosphere. By the time we get to 2.6, the shallow waters now are dominated by cyanobacteria. They argue that the cyanobacteria basically bullied their way in. You get larger continental shelves, more shallow water, so you can get stromatolites. The cyanobacteria love that type of environment. They produce a lot of O2 the methanogens get marginalized. We had a different take on this. We said it had nothing to do with what the cyanobacteria were doing. We're saying the cyanobacteria took over territory that the methanogens lost on their own accord. And our model is based on nickel content and BIF. And these are the pure chemical precipitates, so we filtered out anything that's got any aluminum, titanium, detrital indicators. And what one essentially finds is that when you look at from early on to 2.7, high nickel concentration in BIF, it drops precipitously by 2.5 and then drops even more. We basically argue that that high nickel that's recorded in BIF records the amount of nickel that was in seawater. So the iron particles are trapping what's in seawater at that time getting buried as BIF. So high nickel in BIF means high nickel in seawater. Well, why high nickel before 2.7? Well, the argument we made and what Claude just read out to you at the very beginning is that when you had a hotter mantle, you had the eruption of nickel-rich volcanics like comadiites at 2.7 ends with Claude's comadiite Comadiite belch, is that the term you use? Yeah, basically comadiites end at 2.7. Comadiites are nickel enriched relative to tholeitic basalts. So as the eruption of nickel rich volcanic stops, less nickel is supplied to the oceans. As less nickel is supplied, there's less nickel that gets incorporated in the BIF. And it's all tied to mantle temperature. And one might think, whatever, who cares? So there's less nickel in BIF. But we try to tie this to the biosphere. Less nickel, what does that mean for metalloenzymes? So there's a whole story that a lot of the metalloenzymes we have today are a legacy of what 
the conditions were like when they first evolved. A lot of methanogens, sorry, a lot of bacteria require nickel, but none so much is the methanogens. So there's a lot of different enzymes that the methanogens have that require nickel. So they need nickel more than anybody. We backed out the concentration of dissolved nickel through time. So we see a drop from about 400 nanomolar to about 200 or 150 nanomolar, and then nine is today's average. Previous studies have shown how do methanogens deal with increased nickel or decreased nickel. And what they basically show is that methanogens love their nickel. You add nickel to it, they go very happy. You take nickel away from them, they're a bit sad. And this range of 100 to 500 is where it's really exponential. It's a really critical range. So we basically argue that at this point in time, nickel drops, methanogens starve. Methanogens starve, they produce less methane. They are now marginalized from the waters. The cyanobacteria at the same time are happy as Larry taking over the shallow water. They're producing O2. As methane drops, O2 rises, and that's the tipping point you need for the GOA. Right, and then you could add to it other complexities. For example, we did some experiments that showed that cyanobacteria, it's not like we are the first people to ever dis discover this, but we know from the environment that cyanobacteria don't like high concentrations of iron. Like 50 micromolar becomes problematic. Where does that number come from? Well, 50 micromolar is the estimated concentration of iron that existed at the time of banded iron formations. So at the time that banded iron formations were forming, there was enough iron there that it could have been toxic to cyanobacteria. And the way they deal with the ferrous iron is they produce all these reactive oxygen species internally, which is problematic. So we suggested that at the same time that the cyanobacteria were marginalized until the iron drops and now they're happy. So it's an interplay between what conditions are optimal for them and what conditions aren't. And it's continuously changing in different environments. So the geology impacts on the environment, the bacteria then react to that environment, and then the bacteria in turn change the environment, i.e. produce different gases. So it's all interconnected. So just to sum up, to end up, a fourth point, another possibility is what we thought is, what if there simply wasn't a lot of land mass for cyanobacteria to evolve on? We have all these little Hawaii's all over the place. We don't have these big continents before 2.5. The amount of O2 that could have been produced by mats on the land would have been much smaller, right? So this takes into account not how much continental mass there was, but how much was emergent, right? What we call freeboard. So less continent above water means less that can be colonized by cyanobacteria. Less weathering into the ocean, so less plankton. So is that a possibility? <coughs> and a recent review from Greg Dick has just talked about, in fact, that life probably began as a microbial mat. They have an sol active sulfur cycle because we know anoxygenic, or anoxygenic phototrophs started probably before cyanobacteria, even though cyanobacteria can use sulfide. And he has it in the ocean as a sulfate and on land is O2. And there's this interesting paper that, from Korean Blank way back when, and that group's done other papers where they basically said cyanobacteria probably evolved on land. So what if? Unlike today's present configuration, where we have our continents, ocean circulation, and, and this is just a, basically a Landsat image of chlorophyll levels, so the reds and the greens are high chlorophyll, abundant productivity, and the purples are and the dark blues are low productivity. Instead of something like this where a large land mass occurrence, imagine just little islands scattered all over the place. And on those little islands, we have cyanobacteria on land and circumventing them, or <coughs> around them, as microbial mats. So cyanobacteria could have existed early on, they just didn't have a lot of land mass to colonize. So by default, the amount of O2 they would have produced would have been minimal until the continents get bigger. Once again, trying to tie in the geology to the biology. And where I get really wound up with so many of these stories is they just do things in isolation. I just found this in here and that means it's this. I'll just not even, ignore, I'll just ignore everything anyone else has ever said. No, you gotta put this all into perspective. That's, in my eyes, what we really need to do with this. And I'm just gonna end, I'm not gonna talk about the other things, the elephant in the room. So don't worry, Claude, we're done, for sure. Um, what if cyanobacteria didn't evolve late? So Woody Fish just start off with some of Joe Kirschfink's work, and well, it's a Caltech thing, so let's, let's just be honest. It's Caltech and just Caltech. So they have this model that, well, you know, maybe before O2, so basically, to cut the story short, you don't have O2 evolving until at least 2.3. Okay, there are no cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria could have existed, but they weren't phototrophic. That's what these two papers are basically saying. So there's lots of cyanobacteria. So these are the only phototrophic ones. These guys are not phototrophic. So they're saying photosynthesis is a late addition. O2 is then even a later addition. 
Okay? So the whole reason why the GOA happens at 2.3 or whatever like that, because there were no cyanobacteria before it. And because there were no cyanobacteria before 2.3, if you look at manganese enrichment in 2.45, well obviously they can't be O2, because we just said there's no O2. So it had to be something else, so we invent a, a photo system based on manganese, not been shown to exist, but doesn't stop us from inventing it. That's how we explain it. So do I buy into this? No. But the point being is I have to address it because these guys are looking at the, the, the molecular story and saying it means this. Then you got people like Greg Forney and others at MIT saying, no, no, it's not a bacteria old. The uh, David and Alm paper, whatever, I can't remember what year it is, said that you know, have this mass production or innovation of, cyan of bacteria in general between 3.2 and 2.8 linked to cyanobacteria. So a lot of people believe cyanobacteria early, but there are some who simply don't. And I am going to, unfortunately, leave it at that. And sorry for being really rushed, I just go. Kirk will take some questions now. Well, in that case, I got another five minutes. I'll just. So, taking all what you say without disputing it, uh, what about the photo dissociation of water? Especially in the Archean, you had a lot of CO2, you had a lot of vigorous, uh, it had uh, a lot of clouds punching through the trophic pores, and that probably would enhance it. What is the what is the thinking and how much oxygen you can produce that method? Well, that was something that Jim Casting talked about a long time ago as a source for oxygen. And every model that I've ever read, what it tells me is that didn't, it can produce O2, but not much. So and it's atmospheric O2. So it's up there in the stratosphere. I think it's high. No, anyways, it's, it's not relevant. That's what the general story is on that. It's, it's not my story. It's... Yeah, you only have point zero zero is one oxygen, and so so you're saying it's not relevant at that level. No, all that pulses and all the atmospheric models, the people like Jim Casting and Kevin Zolling, all the ones who are doing this type of work are all saying it's not significant. So Berkner and Marshall did this many years ago in the 90s, early 1970s. Um, so they proposed that oxygen could exist because of the direct radiolysis of water, and it was, it was casting later that showed that you would build up a little bit of an ozone layer from that and be self-quenching. So it, it really doesn't work very well. Surprisingly to me, uh, you know, we still are arguing whether oxygen is a biosignature gas. Uh, and I, I find that a little bit horrifying, because I don't know of any other way of making oxygen other than uh, direct analysis. Oh, can I just really high, really high amounts of very, very short wavelength radiation to, to get oxygen directly from water. At one point, I didn't because Claude, you rushed me. No. I've completely, I completely forgot my point now. No, the one point I wanted to make: why I start off. You, we actually have time. Okay, no, why I start off pessimistic. So, back in the day, right when when Lee did his thing, two thousand eight, it seemed pretty clear that GOE is somewhere between two point five. 2.3, okay? Everyone pretty much agreed with it. Now we have arguing for atmospheric O2 at 3.8. Why I find that discouraging is because instead of constraining things with more information, all this information, it seems like there's a lot of noise out there now in trying to figure out what the actual story is. And the problem is it's hard, it's hard to keep up with the literature. I mean, not just for me, for any of you in your own fields, it's hard to keep up with your literature. As you know, there's so many journals. But there's continuously these Nature Science, PNAS papers coming out saying, hey, I found this. Must mean this. So you have to read through all these papers and try and figure out what does that mean in terms of the broader picture. But these papers aren't doing that. So of course, when someone says, well, you know, Bob showed that there's this. So it must be true. So then we build from that. It's kind of like What's lacking in my field right now is a synthesis paper. Tim Lyons tried to do with this 2014 Nature paper, but lacking a synthesis paper that takes all this other information and says, yes, maybe the chromium concentration in, in the mafic volcanics at three was higher than it was at two point, or maybe subduction over a billion years time scram does this. What does it all mean 
collectively. Because right now we're going, with, there's lots of pieces of the puzzle all over the place that might be right, but no one's putting it together. So to me, that's what I find is the difficult part. And as all these papers come out, it becomes harder and harder to try and imagine putting them all together. That's just me. Is there any uh, discussion or thought on light field in this, what he describes as shallow, uh, earth covering, earth emotion? Sorry, in light? In light limitation of the science. Oh, I, well, at a time when there was lots, well, we've, we've tried to do experiments with, with, with photoferrotrophs at iron, and what we've found is that they receive enough light, 700, 800, all the way down to 100 meters depth. So the photoferrotrophs, the anoxygenic guys, certainly can survive at depth. Well, that was, well, they do in today's ocean, yes, they do, but we modeled it growing it in high iron. It's something like four millimolar iron, which is a ridiculous amount of iron. And we can still do it at depth. What the cyanobacteria do, I don't know how deep they can get. But what limits them from, I mean, UV's not penetrating very deep. The PAL's gonna penetrate deeper, so. Well, I bet you have a lot more UV. But wait, wait, okay. we're gonna just pick up on this. Uh, the, uh, you know, Archie, what do we know about um, we know the chemistry of the Archean atmosphere, I think it's CO2 and methane, basically the two dominant gases, but how thick was it? How opaque was it um, to a certain extent? Um, was it really limiting the amount of light that's actually getting to the surface? Okay, well, uh, on land, on the ocean, it's a different thing. So we have tried to write a paper and it's, it's been bounced back from basically everybody and at some point we're gonna publish it in a Tijuana press because that's the only one who's gonna take it. But where we tried to grow cyanobacteria with high iron and silica and show that in fact, it actually, the scattering of light, these guys are perfectly happy growing at unattenuated UVC fluxes, like at 254 just archaean numbers. On land, not an issue at all. We showed this way back when we were looking at hot springs. I started my work on hot springs is that all it has to take is a quartz sand grain growing underneath it, precipitating your iron silica like at a hot spring. The silica within what was 250 microns, was as thin as we could cut it, essentially filtered out all the UV, but still let 400 to 700 through. So growing on land, you just need a slight covering of something and that's not an issue. I mean, there's arguments, I think Lynn Margul, no, it wasn't Lynn Margul, basically with cyanobacteria, the whole thing about matting in general is that the top guys basically yeah, they're shielded, they're goosed, the guys underneath, so, you know, so they survive, the matting ha actually serves them well, because not only can they move up and down in it, but, you know, some of the guys at the top, well, they're done, but the guys underneath, they're happy. So I don't know, but this is a conversation I had with Paul right before this, is that the whole thing about what role UV has in terms of oxidizing things, I don't know, I've got my own view on oxidizing iron in the oceans as being important, I argued in the past that although UVC does photooxidize iron solution, relative to mineral saturation, that ferrous iron, there's a lot of other sinks for that ferrous iron, like mineral precipitation, if there's oxygen, photoferrotrophs, all those things will affect it before UV light. But UV light still holds. UVC does photooxidize. How about for other things? Th that's one area that uh, kind of bothers me to some extent because I, I came out on this paper on this Karen Smith and Braderman work way back when basically said, no, you're wrong. And what I really want to say is it's not important under these situations. And I thought I wrote that, but I keep getting excited as basically saying they're all wrong. So, hey. We just, we have a question. Well, my knowledge of Arcane is almost nil, but uh, I noticed in several of their pre, pre GOE uh, signals, the proxy seems like they would have a signal at about the same how confident are we that that's actually indicative of an evolving atmosphere as opposed to just being a artifact of a limited heat time record? Uh, well, that's, that's always going to be an issue. We have, I think we have enough samples from the 2.5 time around the globe that we, I, I think those signals are robust. To me, the real issue is what do those signals actually mean? It's the interpretation where I think we go wrong. I have no doubt that, like the, the chromium isotope, that they measure that value. I think they use the wrong rocks to give them the, they use the wrong rocks to give them the interpretation you want. But that number is right. I think 
we have the right numbers, it's how do we interpret it. Now, as we go further back in time, we are really in problems, because at 3.8, you've got Nuvakatuk in northern Quebec, you've got Nuliak in Labrador, and you've got Izua, that's it. And they're all heavily metamorphosed. You could argue anything those rocks have aren't indicative of the primary depositional environment. Which is, and then if you really want to get worse, the whole thing about the Jack Hill zircons. I mean, these zircons are small things, right? From that, you know, they analyze, and they, from that, the story of the Jack Hills is basically based on the oxygen isotopes. We had an ocean at the time of their formation. People have backed out, you know, how much granite there was. Now we're backing out granite. This is from a small microscopic granite. I can't get my head around necessarily there being that much information from that. But I get the fact that we have no choice because there is nothing else to look at. So, but once again, those numbers, I'm not disagreeing with any of the numbers. It's what do those numbers tell us? And I think one of the pitfalls we have with all these trace element proxies, and I work on them, is what do they really mean? So the whole chromium isotope story, right, is predicated on it's an oxidative signature. But since then, papers have come out that serpentinization can give you that, preferential adsorption. So that Sean Crow paper from th about three billion years ago, a recent paper just came out, I'm not sure if it's ChemGel or GCA, from on Schoenberg's group, looking at the exact same thing and saying those chromium isotope fractionations are all surface, or sorry, modern weathering features. They're not indicative. So these rocks have been sitting around for three billion years. Yeah, they were oxidized recently. How do you untangle when things happened? And this is a problem. There's, there's no way around it because that's all we've got, right? So once again, the number might be right, but what is it really telling me? So H2 was probably one of the very first molecules mm -hmm. that was used by a photosynthetic organism. And then potentially later, H2S. And you could use organics. And the last one, the most inaccessible in terms of energy, was water. Um, so I think if we go back and look at the carbon isotope record, it just can't be tied directly to oxygen as being the the electron left residue. Mm -hmm. We have to look at it in, in a planopy of, of hydrogen carriers. And carbon is buried, and it'll always be fractionated, always. In every modern organism that fixes carbon, there's always an isotopic fractionation. It's almost always the same, I think. Um, but I don't know how we can directly link the carbon isotope record to, or any of the isotope records that you mentioned, directly to us. So the only thing that I think of today is the far, far paper still. It's still valid. Okay. Yeah, and if and so it doesn't tell you when oxygen evolved early on, but it tells you when you at least oxidized the atmosphere, right? Yeah. And just to follow up on the point, just if yeah, you bury organic carbon at 3.5 or whatever you find in rock record, but if it's not tied to o cyanobacteria, there is no O2 story, what does it mean? I absolutely agree. Are there any other questions? Well, look, at, uh, we have one, time for one more. Okay, quick one maybe. Okay. Yeah, so you made the argument at some point in here, and I'm not sure I kept up with everything, but that, that the chromium 3 signal we would never make it, it would be oxidized before it got to the ocean and that recorded in. Reduced. Uh, their argument is you oxidize chromium-3, so I'm right here, oxidizing chromium-3 yeah. to chromium-6. Chromium-6 now has to get over there, you're the ocean. I've got to get from here to there. Chromium-6, the second it hits, sees ferrous iron, gets reduced back to chromium-3, it's insoluble. How do I get from here to you without seeing ferrous iron at a time when there's nothing but mafic volcanic rocks? You're talking about chromium-3 being insoluble, and yet we have chromium-3 in substantial amounts in today's oxygen. Mm -hmm. Any comparison there? Well, a lot of the chromium is going to be tied up with organic ligands. And that's, that's the big thing is that don't want to re-invoke. So yes, you can, you can solubilize chromium, like you can solubilize many metals with organic ligands. So the chromium you're seeing is organically complex. What does that now mean in terms of what is a fractionation associated with stuff like that? There is one paper that reported that from deep sea vents and I can't remember what way the fractionation went. 
but that's, yeah. When I showed the flat line for the copper and all that, my feeling for a lot of these things are a lot of that stuff's organically complex. That's the sink in solution DOC. So whether it tells anything about a sulfitic ocean, oxic ocean, frigid ocean, I think carbon can bind some trace metals more than anything else. That's a whole new level of complexity. What kind of DOC do we have? So that's kind of the stuff why my group is going into right now. What is the role of DOC early on? Okay. 